Joining us now, Chiron Skinner, research fellow for the Hoover Institution and co-author of the book, Reagan in His Own Hand. I love the book, Chiron, published a few years ago. Those commentaries that Ronald Reagan wrote for his Viewpoint radio series that you helped make into that book. And Chiron, we're so glad to have you here joining us, Skyping in from Pittsburgh. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. And Chiron, as you had some time to spend at the White House to see uh, the work of President Reagan and Jim Brady, uh, sadly, Brady's days as press secretary, uh, effectively running the shot, came to a sudden uh, dramatic and tragic end, although he maintained the title and fought back for his recovery. When you look back at Jim Brady, the man, Jim Brady, the press secretary, Chiron, what did Mr. Brady bring to the job of presidential press secretary? That's an important question, and thanks for asking it, and thanks for actually doing this segment to highlight the importance of how politics and biography can often intersect in ways that um, change the arc of history, and that's exactly what happened on March 30th, 1981. But I must say, I was actually a senior in college at the time, so I was not at the White House. Um, I was an observer as a young person, horrified by what was happening. It was only later, as you mentioned, when I did the work on Reagan and his own hand and Reagan and life and letters that I was introduced in a more intimate way through the archives, the story of, Ra of Brady, of Reagan, and the two other brave American officers who were shot that day when um, John Hinckley Jr. Um, fired six rounds. Um, but to really get to your point, um, Bra James Brady has had a profound impact on, um, I think, um, White House and Washington politics. And I mean it in a very specific sense, that instead of becoming a victim, he um, lived up really to conservative principles of individualism, of durability, um, of the American, indomitable American spirit of recovery and redemption. And through that, he helped um, change Reagan's own thinking about gun control, though Reagan was a lifelong member of the NRA and one of the few to have um, a lifetime status in that organization. He did support the Brady Bill and wrote so in the New York Times in the post-presidential years um, for having just basic background, federal background checks and a waiting period um, for those who seek to purchase guns. It was modest legislation, um, but it's something that Brady and his wife Sarah devoted themselves to, and it's what I think we expect of Americans um, who commit themselves to public service. He remained a public servant even after he was wheelchair bound. Um, he took the, the most severe bullet um, shot of all of those um, um, who were shot that day by Hinckley. He was wheelchair bound, but he remained the Reagan press secretary through the Reagan presidency, though he couldn't do the job in, in a complete way. Um, Marlon Fitzwater took the title of acting or um, press secretary so that James Brady in a dignified way could continue um, to support the public relations dimension of the Reagan White House. Karen, people always talk about, you know, Brady's wit and warmth. Do you think that helped him deal with the trauma of being shot and disabled? And also, current White House press secretary, the, the current one, said that Brady basically revolutionized the role. Do you agree with that? I do because he, um, b well before he was shot, he actually is is um, reported to have said um, early on um, that um, he um, was coming to the um, press corps not on his sheer good looks but on his sheer <laughs> talent because reportedly Nancy Reagan was concerned that he wasn't attractive enough to be um, the spokesperson for the White House. But he quickly um, um, cast aside that that concern by being someone who had a rapport with the reporters that I think set a higher bar for those who would come after him. And it was that rapport that has lasted for decades in Washington and ultimately led in 2000 um, to, pres um, to having the White House press room renamed in his honor by President Clinton. Um, he became a larger than life um, figure that was appealing to both parties because um, I think of the sheer capacity that he and his wife demonstrated in remaining committed to having a more responsible approach to gun legislation. And Chiron, we will have to end it there. We thank you for your insights and your memories of James Brady and also appreciate the books you've written, including uh, uh, co-authoring Reagan in his own hand. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Well.
Let's turn now to something that's an epic moment in American history, the end of prohibition. That's the subject of this American moment. It was intended to take the roar out of America's roaring 20s, but instead its passage divided the nation and began an era of bootleggers, speakeasies, and rum-running gangsters. When ratified in 1919, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution outlawed the manufacturing, transportation, and sale of intoxicating liquors. Consequently, organized crime was quick to step up and quench the thirst of an eager nation. The Volstead Act gave federal agencies the legal authority to enforce prohibition. But with an average of only 30 enforcement agents per state, the illegal liquor flowed freely. By 1925, in New York City alone, authorities estimated over 100,000 illegal bars were thriving with customers consisting of friends, neighbors, and lawmakers alike. Still, some law enforcement became famous fighting the booze trade. One was Elliot Ness. As a top agent of the Bureau of Prohibition, Ness led a team of men known as the Untouchables. Tough and incorruptible, they brought down Chicago bootlegger and mobster Al Capone. But bowing to public pressure in his 1932 presidential campaign, Franklin Roosevelt endorsed the repeal of prohibition. It was later reported with the depression in full swing and national morale at rock bottom. Then President Roosevelt remarked, I think we could all do with a beer. With the passage of the 21st Amendment on December 5, 1933, prohibition was officially repealed, making the 18th Amendment the only amendment in the U.S. Constitution repealed by the passage of another. Still, even with the repeal of prohibition, many states chose to remain dry, the longest running of which was Mississippi, who didn't repeal their self-imposed prohibition until 1966. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment.